Hey guys, welcome to part two of your evolution video notes. So in the last set, we talked about Darwin and natural selection and some of the things that impact natural selection. So in this set of video notes, we're going to talk about the evidence for evolution and the things that shape our evolutionary theory today. When we talk about evidence, there are four things. So fossil record, anatomical evidence, molecular evidence, and embryonic development. All right, let's get into it. When we talk about fossil record, first of all, why are fossils important? Why do we even care? Well, they give a record of extinct species, but they also help you determine the ancestry of an organism. There are also two types of dating you should know about. There's relative dating and absolute dating. Relative dating, think about it, relative, general, it just determines the approximate age of a fossil. Absolute, or radiometric dating, uses actual isotope decay to find out the exact age of a fossil. When we talk about evidence, there's three different anatomical evidences that we're going to focus on. First being homologous. So from the genetics unit, remember homo, same. So homologous structures are the same structure, in this case bone structure, but they have different functions. And this also means that they share a common ancestor. So our example here is a whale fin and a bat wing. They have the same bone structures, especially if you look here at this picture, the different colors correspond to each other, but they use them for drastically different things. In terms of other types of anatomical evidence, we also have analogous structures. So this is different structure, but the same function, like flying, and they don't have a common ancestor. So let's look at, for example, you have a butterfly wing, and a bird wing. They both use them to fly, but butterflies aren't even vertebrates. They don't even have bones in their wings. Vestigial structures are another form of anatomical evidence, and these are forms of structures that are reduced or absent, but they are still functional in other species. So think about it. An appendix in humans, I'm sure all of you know at least somebody that's had their appendix taken out. It really doesn't have a function in humans anymore. Whales and snakes also have pelvic girdles showing their ancestors had hind limbs. Molecular evidence then talks about DNA. So the more similar the DNA is between two organisms, the closer the relationship. Protein also shows similarities. And an example here is chickens and dinosaurs. They are very closely related, more so than modern day reptiles and dinosaurs. Uh, embryonic development then suggests that similar embryonic development suggests that species are more closely related. So all vertebrates start development in a similar manner. If we look at this picture here, this is the introduction of an embryo, and these are all vertebrates. Oh my gosh, this dog. They are all vertebrates, but as you see, as they move through the development, they get drastically different. In terms of shaping evolutionary theory, there's some different effects that we need to talk about and some different relationships that drive evolution. So the founder effect, think about it, if you found something, you, you saw it first or you're establishing something. So this is when a population is established by a very small amount of individuals. So let's say these little ladybugs here are like, you know what, we wanna move to a new place. We're gonna move to a new forest. And they don't really represent all members of the species because they only have the diversity that they brought with them and then they're going to interbreed and produce offspring with their genes. We also have the bottleneck effect. So this is when a large percentage of the population is killed and only a few survive, which as I'm sure you could guess is typically common after natural disasters. So if we look at this population here, you see there's some sort of natural disaster, maybe a flood or a tornado or something like that. And then your remaining individuals only have recessive genes. So that's going to create a much different population. And there's just a different visual over here for you as well. In terms of gene flow, this is when genes enter or leave a population. Immigration and emigration are two terms you should be familiar with. So if you emigrate somewhere, you are leaving and moving somewhere else. And if you immigrate, you are entering or you're coming to that country, for example, is how we typically associate these terms. But also births and deaths contribute to gene flow within a population because you're getting genes that enter, hence sexual reproduction, meiosis, you have vastly different alleles that are present. And then deaths, those individuals are dying. 
coevolution then is the evolution of one species directly affecting the evolution of another. So this is typically a mutualistic relationship or a predator-prey relationship, such as these hummingbirds and flowers. If you look at the beaks of the hummingbirds, especially this one, check out how over time that beak has evolved to fit to the shape of the flower. Now this goes back to natural selection. So hummingbirds with straight beaks probably weren't as successful in getting nectar. They weren't as strong. They couldn't produce as many offspring. They didn't live as long. Whereas the ones that maybe as a result of a mutation had a curved beak were able to be successful and pass on their genes. Convergent evolution is a topic that is sometimes confusing, and this is when unrelated, key here, unrelated species evolve similar traits over time. So they have similar adaptations, but these structures are analogous structures. So they do the same thing, but they're different, different structures. So an example here is sharks and dolphins. Both of them have streamlined bodies, they have tall dorsal fins, they have very powerful tails. They're all adaptations to be successful ocean predators, but they are not related. There is not a common ancestor. If you look here at this cladogram, you see sharks all the way over there, and mammals are things like dolphins at the total opposite end of the cladogram. Divergent evolution, then, is the opposite, kind of, of that. It's when one species develops into separate species, two or more, and they become more and more dissimilar over time, eventually getting to the point where they can't even reproduce with each other to create offspring, so they become separate species. So an example here is killer whales and dolphins. You see they diverged from a common ancestor here, and then also things like butterfly species. So what started as this butterfly here eventually went into this type and this type to where you have two totally separate species. Adaptive radiation then is another version of divergent evolution, except this is where one species gives rise to many, so more than two or three, and it's usually in response to a new habitat or some sort of other ecological influence. Darwin's finches, of course, are the most popular example of adaptive radiation because they all share this common finch ancestor that all of their different beak shapes came from. Cichlids are also an example here. If you look at their lips, you see their lips are adapted to the type of food source they eat. That last one's pretty crazy. And that is all for your second set of notes.